West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com This Friday is the two-year anniversary of the January 6th attacks. The events of that day led to criminal prosecutions and played a role, a pretty big one, in the midterm elections. They also changed the careers of two House Republicans who chose to serve on the January 6th committee, and largely as a result of that patriotic service, they both are now leaving Congress. Joining me now is the outgoing Republican Congressman of Illinois, Adam Kinzinger. Thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Let's start with the work that you've been doing over the past almost two years, the January 6th committee. It's over and it's now in the hands of the Justice Department. Do you think that President Trump ultimately will be charged for crime? Look, I mean, when I got into this, when we started this process, I didn't know, you know, I'm not a lawyer, not a Justice Department guy, didn't necessarily know, is he guilty of a crime or not? Obviously what he did from a presidential perspective, from an oath perspective is a problem. As we've gotten into this, I look and I'm like, yeah, if, if this is not a crime, I don't know what is. If, if a president can incite an insurrection and not be held accountable, then really there's no limit to what a president can do or can't do. And so, yeah, I do, I do think, Ultimately, when we get to where we're going to go, I think the Justice Department will do the right thing. I think he will be charged, and I frankly think he should be. I mean, everything we've uncovered from what he did with the Justice Department to everything leading up to January 6th to on January 6th, sitting there for 180 minutes and watching this occur in the hope that maybe, just maybe, that last attempt to stay in power will work. So he should be charged and convicted. That's, so that's my personal opinion. It's not from a, uh, from well, a lawyer or justice department. Based on the that you've been collecting. Yes, and it appears, like, I look at that and I go, if he is not guilty of a crime, then I, I frankly fear for the future of this country because now every future president can say, hey, here's the bar. And the bar is do everything you can to stay in power. You talk about the, the future of this country. As you are uh, on your way out and uh, leaving Congress behind, are you optimistic or fearful for American democracy? It's <sighs> a tough question. So typically I'm always optimistic. I try to be, you can't do this job if you're not. I'm a little fearful in the short term. You know, we're in a moment where facts don't really matter. What matters to people is just uh, what your opinion is and the facts that, that comport to that matter. We're in, a, we're in a moment where about half the country believes there are, that the election was stolen. Maybe a third of the country now believes the election was stolen. But if you're in a democracy and you believe that your vote doesn't count, that's dangerous. So in the short term, I'm, I'm a little pessimistic. But I am, in the long term, very optimistic for this country because I look back at trends. I look back at rough times we have been in. And we've always come out. And we haven't just come out of them. We've come out stronger. So look, democracies are not defined by bad days. We're defined by how we come out of those bad days. And so in the long term, I am optimistic. But I, I got to say to people, this is not a moment to rest. 
This is a moment where you have to understand there have to be uncomfortable alliances to defend democracy. Um, but we can do this. If you had a way back machine oh. and could go back a couple of years and tell the Congressman Adam Kinzinger of, um, I don't know, the just the 2020 election, <sighs> uh, what you would be doing for the two years following, would you say, yeah, go for it? Would you have done anything differently? I, you know, it's, it's a great question because I get asked that a lot, like, you know, would you have done it differently? Obviously, there's, there's been some sacrifice and everything in it. I wouldn't do one thing differently. Look, I, you know, the way this has kind of gone in the last couple of years, it's been tough, right? You know, I've had extended family that sent me letters telling me I was working on behalf of Satan. I mean, that's not something I could have imagined. You had imagined. members of your family saying yeah. that? Yeah, I mean, and it's not, nothing I could have imagined, you know, a couple of years ago. But what that does to me is it reminds me of just how bad of a place we've gotten to. And, you know, everybody in their life, and I was no different when I was a young guy. You know, you always imagine a moment where you can stand alone and where you're like the one person that, that can do the right thing in a crowd, right? Everybody imagines this moment. Very few people get a chance to actually do that. And I've learned in this job that very few of those that get the chance actually do it. Um, I feel honored to have been at this moment in history and to have done the right thing. You know, my kids are going to be proud of it. That's something that I take very seriously. And uh, yeah, I wouldn't have done anything different. When Congress is sworn in in two days, you're getting a little emotional. Sorry. <laughs> Just a little. Yeah. This is tough for you. Yeah. I think it's, it's, so I'm not going to miss the job. I'm glad I'm not going to be back. It gives me time to focus on broader things, bigger fights. But it is, it, I like, you know, thinking of Adam Kinzinger when he's 32, kind of the new freshman, uh, you know, kind of like optimistic and bright eyed to where we are today. It's, it's, it's an emotional thing because it's 12 years of my life, right? And, you know, I, I got into this single, now I'm married with a kid, so I, I can think about that legacy. Um, it's been a heck of a ride, sure has. Well, I was going to ask if you are going to be sad not to be part of the next Congress in a couple of days. No. <laughs> I, I, w I won't. Look, I, you know, it's, it's, I want to still be able to have an opinion, right? So that's going to be tough is, I think, adjusting to the fact that people will have less interest in what you have to say. Um, but it's a tough time in Congress right now. I mean, it is, I'm looking at what this is shaping out to be. And I know the tough things we have gone through uh, in the past. This is going to be a really tough year. What does it say about the future of your party, the Republican Party, that Marjorie Taylor Greene and people like her are kind of ascendant and the Adam Kinzinger and Liz Cheney's of the world are no longer in the in the Congress. I, I think it says to me that the Republican Party is not the future of this country unless it corrects, right? Unless there's a change. Because I got to tell you, uh, if you think of a successful America in 20 years, that's not going to be an America based on what Marjorie Taylor Greene wants or based on what some of these radicals want. The only way this country can succeed is if we learn to work together. We once called Kevin McCarthy a true friend. Yeah. If you could sit him down, just the two of you, right now, what would you say? I just let him know I'm disappointed. Right? I mean, he has he as a leader, not just a member of Congress, as a leader of Congress, he had an opportunity to tell the truth to the American people. And he went to Mar-a-Lago a couple weeks after January 6th and resurrected Donald Trump. He is the reason Donald Trump is still a factor. He is the reason that um, some of the crazy elements of the House still exist. If he didn't go down there, you think Trump would have been iced out? I do. I do. I think, I think first off, had we actually removed Trump from office during impeachment, that would have been huge, right? So that's on McConnell and, and some of the Republicans in the Senate. But yeah, I think the second, because I lived it, the second... Kevin McCarthy went to Mar-a-Lago. The conference went from like quiet, what are we going to do, where are we going to go, to begrudgingly defending Donald Trump again. He is responsible. Actually, Donald Trump should consider Kevin McCarthy his best friend because Donald Trump is alive today politically because of Kevin McCarthy. Last year you told the Huffington Post you would love to go up against Trump in the 2024 primary. You said, quote, I think it'd be fun. It would be fun. Are you going to run for president? No, it's not my intention, no. But it would be fun to run against him because he stands up and just lies. He tells untruths. 
People love it because it's entertaining. But eventually people have a concern for their country. So no, my intention is not to run in 2024. Um, but it would be fun. It would be fun to stand on a stage with Donald Trump and actually tell the truth because when he's on a stage, it's nothing but lies that come out. Well, no matter what you do, I don't think that this is the last that we're here. We're going to hear from Adam Kinzinger. Thank you so much, and thank you for your service. You're obviously also uh, in, the, uh, in the military, so thank you for that and, and everything that you've done in Congress as well. You bet. Thank you. It is Monday, the 2nd of January of 2023, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special on this fine New Year's Monday is River City Hash Mondays. Hey, Happy New Year. All right. Well, uh, I, I think I might be able to embrace the number 23. See, I think I might be able to do it. We'll see how long that lasts. I Have I written a check with 23 on it yet? I don't believe I have. But I have some checks that are needed to be uh, uh, cut at the moment, so I might have to do that. People write checks around here. When I moved back from the Bay Area to care for my mom, I didn't believe people use checks. And they do. And people accept them. So I've just, uh, I don't know, when in Rome, as they say. So, yes, uh, I I hope I don't put 22 on because uh, would the check be uh, uh, legitimate then? I think you only have three months to uh, deposit that check. I think it's three months. Anyway, how did we get off on that tangent? Well, you know how we do it here. It is a salon after all, and uh, we had a weekend. It's still a holiday today, a banking holiday. And uh, government offices, by and large, will be closed. So uh, and when I say by and large, there's a lot going on in the world. So there's still parts of government open as we make this transition in the House to whatever it is that they're doing right now. <laughs> yeah. Repugs in disarray. Oh, I was uh, warned by a follower and someone I'm following on Twitter. Yes, I'm still there. That uh, he got a notice from Daily Kos that he's not allowed to use the term maggot, and I had actually forgotten that 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 is a a, a rule that's been on Daily Kos for some time now, because it might elicit or trigger people towards revulsion and other kinds of negative uh, uh, things that might be attributed to, like, the insect maggot, the, the larva, the pupa of, of a fly, and that would cause people to act out violently, or could. So <clears throat> uh, the term maggots and maggot uh, is verboten on Daily Kos. And I had forgotten that because I, asked, I uh, uh, sent off a a uh, message to the help desk on Daily Kos asking about that and and why, and then they jogged my memory when they said, actually, it's been, uh, you know, officially something, and, you know, you're just not supposed to be using that. So so I've uh, decided that in that case, maybe, maybe I shouldn't be using the term maggot because it is, you know, dehumanizing and uh, does elicit revulsion to where you want to, like, step on it, I guess, you know. So from now on, I'm just uh, going to call them MAGA Nazis because there's a big difference between, you know, a poopa and a goose-stepping uh, fascist. So I would think MAGA Nazi might elicit a certain level of revulsion, too. But they're not insects. Just don't attribute a human being, even if they're Nazis, to an insect. Okay, just letting you know. So MAGA Nazis it is from now on. It's more characters than just maggots. Uh, oh, I guess we're supposed to be having we're supposed to get four thousand characters or more, but you gotta pay eight bucks. So I'm not doing that. I'm gonna move to Mastodon, damn it. I'm gonna just gonna have to take the time and do it. If I don't have enough to do already, boy, they just don't make, you know, when you invent the wheel, let's stop reinventing the wheel. 
All righty. All righty. Okay, well, enough of that. Uh, Adam Kinsinger uh, is almost no more. And uh, you hate to see it, but I got to tell you, on the other hand, Kinsinger and Cheney are not our friends. <laughs> Do not kid yourselves. They voted against us on key issues. I know you maybe like abortion. Just saying. Certain fundamental rights, certain kinds of oversight. Do you think Liz Cheney is not, you know, after some power herself? Please. She's not Cheney. Okay. You know, in this instance, I understand because, look, you <laughs> you don't want a mobster messing up your game. You know, they work really hard on this and... Uh, uh, yeah, you know, sure, they they had to deal with mobsters, but they were kind of hoping, you know, to keep them at, at arm's length, and, and now they are <laughs> they got into the Oval Office. They're vying for the Speakership of the House. <sighs> Lots of Russian money. George Santos, that's not his real name. It's Tony DeValder or something. I, actually, it's George Anthony DeValder Santos. I think that's how that goes. But he insisted on being called Anthony up until recently. And then it was George. Okay. I'm telling you, that guy's got some backing from Russian money, and I am not kidding. It is a certifiable fact. Let's be clear about this. And everybody's just like, oh, poo-pooing it. I remember when Al Gore went to Hacienda Heights and went to a Buddhist temple because that whole part of the San Gabriel Valley, after Vietnam, uh, we got a giant influx, influx of Southeast Asians moving, and they moved there. So he goes to a Buddhist temple and gets a campaign donation. Might have been right or wrong, I don't know. But they made such a big deal about it. I mean, they even made a deal about it when they took the presidency away from Al Gore and handed it to George Bush when uh, his brother was running Florida. Hanging chads. Stop the count. The Brooks Brother Rice. Did you know Kavanaugh was at the Brooks Brothers riot? Because he was a Brooks Brother rioter. That's why. Just saying, everybody gets rewarded for the work they do. So, you know, they worked on this for a long time. And then here comes Trump, who was a mobster from the get go. I mean, Jesus, dad was mobbed up in the 50s. Maybe even before that. Considering grandpa was a pimp. And I'm not lying. I'm not kidding. I'm serious. How do you think they got the leg up? ill-gotten gains. But that's how you do it in America, and then you're supposed to be legitimate. And Trump never went that route to legitimacy, let's be clear. Couldn't get loans from the New York Italian mob anymore, so he says, well, you know, there's all those Russians who are just willing to launder money at exorbitant rates. I mean, we already went through how there were these pass-throughs uh, in Florida mansions with Trump, let alone, you know, uh, sweets at his hotels. Jeez, give me a break. Anyway, so uh, Liz Cheney and Kinzinger, you know, they're on the outs. There's a power struggle. You let you let mobsters with you know a bit of fascist tendencies in, and next thing you know, MAGA Nazis in disarray. Speaking of which, <laughs> I don't know how it is that I make this association, but uh, Elon, is that how you say his name? I like to say Ellen. Elon considers himself to be a moderate, and the only people who consider him not to be a moderate or right wing are we extreme liberals. And what defines an extreme liberal? I'm telling you, if you think... People who would adhere to Eisenhower policies. If you think that those people are extreme or commies like the Birchers did back in the day, 
I'm just saying that doesn't mean that doesn't make you a moderate. What does that make you? Well, it kind of makes you fairly uh, extreme in your right wing tendencies, Elon. Tech bro libertarianism is what all that is. And it's, you know. But then I hear that uh, Peter Thiel and Musk are having a little bit of a falling out, which they actually did for a while. I mean, Thiel pushed uh, Elon out of out of uh, PayPal. So, you know, that's another that's another business that Elon says that he created, but he didn't. He had something that was sort of like that, but it wasn't as good. And so he, he took over PayPal in the normal fashion. Become a member of the board. Take it over. Say that you're a coder. And then uh, Peter Thiel and, uh, oh, I think it was Singer, too. Was it Singer? I can't remember. But another uh, uh, party, all of them and, you know, the usual suspects. And then Peter Thiel and the others pushed Elon out because of, well, his erratic behavior. All right. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? And then you got George Santos. Or should I say Anthony? I don't know. Which is it? Tony or George? I guess right now it's George. All right. Uh, apparently there's a heat wave in Europe right now melting all the snow in the Alps. That'll be good. Let's ignore it, okay? Let's pretend it doesn't exist. Sort of like COVID and all this other stuff. Did you know that we're so far uh, low on Tamiflu that they're taking it out of the national stockpile because people are getting the flu so bad right now? And then they're still whining about people wearing masks. I don't want to wear a mask because it's an infringement upon my freedom. Okay, well, then when everybody's dying of flu, what are you going to do? Can't, you're going to complain about the government not having Tamiflu. You know, for the party that says, get government off the backs of business, they were sure quick to blame Pete for Southwest Airlines' uh, meltdown. They're always whining that government's not doing the job when all of the other times they say government can't do the job and they defund the government. All right. Well, we can ignore that, too. All right. We can like I don't know. Let's let's uh, let's shop for boxes of corn dogs. Take our minds off the ills of the world. I got to tell you, if I'm buying boxes of frozen corn dogs anywhere, <laughs> I am part of the ill of the world. I don't buy corn dogs in any form. Just saying. Some people like them, but it's carnival food, and I was never fond of carnival food. Well, we have gone far adrift in this new year, so why don't we reel it back in? Here we go. Reel, reel, reel. Okay, it's kind of fighting me. But we got a strong pull with a long, you know, very high tensile quotient line. And we shall pull this in right now and get into the curated part of the show so we can move it along because the time is just, uh, you know, is it wasting? No, it's never a waste. We just use it. In mass quantities. On the rest of the menu here in the Bistro Cafe on this fine new year, a Sacramento County Superior Court judge put a temporary hold on a new California law boosting protections for fast food workers. The Illinois Supreme Court has halted provisions of a new law that would eliminate cash bail for criminal defendants. You know, they just love to nullify elections, don't they? Yes, they do. And blackouts after coal and natural gas units went offline during dangerously cold conditions has intensified questions about the Tennessee Valley Authority's recent decision to double down on fossil fuels. After the break, we move to the chef's table where Dubai ended its 30% tax on alcohol sales in the shakedom. And Croatia rang in the new year as a fully integrated EU member. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit.
page at netrootsradio.com. To the right of the page is the chat room link, and the chat room is monitored by Kelly Link. And even in this fine new year, thank you, Kelly. To the left of that chat room link across the page, uh, near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com, is the perpetual link to our Patreon site. And if you could become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio, it really does help. And I'll just repeat what I've said for uh, you know a couple of years now, several, is that if you could afford to send us what you might spend on an espresso-type coffee drink once a month, those funds really do help us pay our bills. So thank you to those of you who have, and thank you to those of you who consider that you might do so in the future, because we could use the help. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter while we're still there, and you still can, do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that. He also takes care of our Mastodon site, and I'll get up to speed and give you that uh, that addy also. But it's uh, available um, at the links provided where you know on my Twitter feed, for instance, where you can find me. Oh, thank you, Tom, for taking care of Twitter, uh, the Twitter feed and the Mastodon feed and uh, graphics and everything else that you do. Thank you. All right. Follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam, because as I uh, mentioned, the links to our Twitter feed and Mastodon feed and all of that can be found. And uh, most importantly, the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's can be found by if you follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. And those show notes and links is where you can find the actual articles in which we are referencing here in this salon we call West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West, and please do pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, and wherever podcasts can be found. All righty then. This first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy River City Hash Mondays is by Shauna Hussein, or I'm sorry, Suhana Hussein. From the Los Angeles Times, a Sacramento County Superior Court judge has put a temporary hold on a new California law boosting protections for fast food workers that was set to go into effect yesterday on the 1st of January. The order comes in response to a lawsuit that was filed uh, late Thursday, by the way by a coalition of major restaurant and business trade groups that is backing an effort to overturn the law called Assembly Bill 257 through a referendum on the California ballot in November of 2024. They can't wait. So if the referendum referendum qualifies for the ballot, it would block AB 257 until voters have a say. I thought they already had a say, and they voted that they wanted it. Eh, That's just me. The coalition called Save Local Restaurants took issue with the State Department of Industrial Relations' effort to implement AB 257 on January 1st, arguing that because the referendum effort is well underway, it renders the law unenforceable. What? Implementing the law would set a harmful precedent that threatens voters' right of referendum, the coalition said. I, 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 wait, 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 wait. People voted on this. And now you have a referendum in which you're gathering signatures. And you say it's well underway because you hired a bunch of -of out-of-state signature gatherers to go and get signatures at vast amounts that are going to be thrown out in vast amounts. And maybe you'll have enough and maybe you won't. And so in the interim, they're going to go to court and say, don't implement this law until voters have a say. The voters had a say. I keep saying that, but that's what I keep saying. All right. Aaron Mellon, a spokesperson with Governor Newsom's office, said that the law would be put into effect while election authorities completed the process of verifying voter signatures necessary to qualify the referendum. However, 
State officials will, of course, abide by any court order, she said in an email. Also known as the Fast Recovery Act, AB 257, among other things, creates a worker representative body with the power to raise wages. And that is why this group cannot stand that. The temporary restraining order issued by Sacramento County Superior Court Judge Shelley Ann W.L. Chang said, in light of the incredibly short time frame provided to the court to hear this matter, meaning it was on last Thursday and the first was Sunday, the lawsuit, uh, she wrote, the lawsuit was filed Thursday and sought an injunction for the next day, meaning Friday, and the order prevents the law from being implemented until the court has a chance to hear the case and decide whether to whether to grant a preliminary injunction, so she set the hearing for January 13th. The deadline for election authorities to complete a random sample verification of signatures is January 25th, and the California Secretary of State's office will decide whether to certify the referendum after verification is complete. Associated Press staff brings us this next offering of voter nullification here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The Illinois Supreme Court has halted provisions of a new law that would eliminate cash bail for criminal defendants, issuing a stay hours, just mere hours, before the new policies were set to a take effect yesterday, Sunday. The high court said in Saturday's order that the stay was needed to, quote, maintain consistent pretrial procedures throughout Illinois, end quote, as the court prepares to hear arguments on the matter. The order said the court would coordinate with uh, an expedited process for an appeal the Illinois Attorney General's office filed on Friday with the court of a local judge's ruling which found that eliminating cash bail for criminal defendants is unconstitutional. Democrats who control the Illinois General Assembly had pushed for eliminating the posting of a cash bond, a practice long used to ensure that people accused of crimes appear at trial. Opponents of requiring bail contend that it results in the poor and innocent sitting in jail, awaiting their day in court, while the wealthy and guilty go free. Well, of course, Republicans said they fear that eliminating cash bail risks potentially releasing dangerous criminals. As if, if you're rich, you're less dangerous? Give me a break. Anyway, what they're worried about is that they're just not going to be releasing the poor. Their argument that it is unconstitutional to hold the wealthy against their will.
Matisse and Travis Lawler of the Associated Press brings us this final offering in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy River City Hash Mondays. A federal utilities decision to resort to rolling blackouts after coal and natural gas units went offline during dangerously cold conditions has intensified questions about the Tennessee Valley Authority's recent decision to double down on fossil fuels. TVA experienced its highest ever winter peak power demand on December 23rd as an Arctic blast brought blinding blizzards, freezing rain, and frigid cold from Maine to Seattle. The Tennessee Valley Authority said in an email that a combination of high winds and freezing temperatures caused its coal-burning Cumberland fossil plant to go offline at one point when critical instrumentation froze up. A second coal-burning plant, Bull Run, also went offline. And uh, the utility had issues with some other natural gas units as well. The Tennessee Valley Authority's coal and gas plants failed to or failed us over the holiday, uh, spokesperson Scott Brooks said in an email. People across the Tennessee Valley were forced to deal with rolling blackouts even as temperatures plunged into the single digits. Uh, Environmental Law Center Tennessee Office Director Amanda Garcia said that despite the obvious failure, the federal utility is still planning to spend billions to build new gas plants and pipelines. TVA provides power to 10 million people in parts of seven southern states. The federal utility issued a statement last Wednesday saying it takes full responsibility for the rolling blackouts on December 23rd and 24th, just as many customers were preparing for Christmas. The utility was already facing scrutiny for its recommendation to replace some aging coal-burning power plants with natural gas instead of renewables and energy conservation measures like solar, wind, heat pumps, and LEDs. The decision to increase the, uh, the use of natural gas was made just as TVA is about to seat six new board members nominated by Joe Biden to fill out its nine-member board of directors. So in other words, they wanted to keep the coal in place before Dark Brandon shut it down. Well, already the TVA is facing a lawsuit that claims it violated federal law by approving a gas power plant that is under construction at the retired coal-burning Johnsonville fossil plant without properly assessing the environmental and climate impacts. The TVA has declined to comment on the lawsuit that was filed last month. All right, let us now get to our break, and when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world, and we will finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. We will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. This week, sense and a different sensibility. If an American filmmaker wrote and directed a movie that was centered on a black-white interracial relationship and was set, off-season, in a seaside tourist town at the beginning of the 80s when growing conservatism went hand-in-hand with increased racist harassment and violence, it would be a melodrama, it would use nostalgia to pull people in with 80s clothes and hair and a big budget for licensed music, you know, so they could sell the soundtrack. And finally, it would be a message film. So it can be surprising for Americans when British writer-director Sam Mendes gives us In Empire of Light. 
First, there's more than race going on in Hillary and Stephen's relationship. I mean, he's black, she's white, but also he's young and she's older. And how do I say this? He's neurochemically abled while she suffers from mental illness. Those could be two other movies right there. Plus, Hillary has a relationship with her boss that's important, and she has these co-workers who don't have arcs but have significant moments. Okay, so you think, maybe it's not a film about this couple. Maybe it's about her. Hillary, she's our focus, slice of life, her life. And she is our guide through the film, until she isn't. At one point, she just leaves the narrative, and the movie follows somebody else, never fully centering on her again. Also, most of the story takes place in this lovingly shot movie palace, so there's got to be some metafilm commentary, right? And there is this speech about how we don't see the darkness between frames of film, giving the illusion of movement, the illusion of life. And you think, okay, that sounds like a centering thematic statement. But Mendes doesn't present it as a lesson that anyone has to learn. Maybe we do? I don't know. It's like Sam Mendes has written a short story and filmed it. You've got all these interesting characters, images, and related concepts with a narrative spur here and there that we're just supposed to let resonate. Empire of Light is so not an American movie, and that's not a bad thing. Just know that going in. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Arthritis is common among veterans. Traumatic and overuse injuries during active duty are risk factors for developing arthritis. Fortunately, there are low-cost or no-cost strategies that can help veterans manage arthritis. Physical activity can reduce pain and improve function. It can also help improve mood and play a role in managing other chronic conditions, such as heart disease, diabetes, and obesity. You can do low-impact activities, such as walking, biking, swimming, and water aerobics, all good forms of exercise. Arthritis-specific classes can help you get started. Information on classes, exercise programs, and tools are available at cdc.gov arthritis. These resources can help reduce pain and improve function. Learning self-management techniques can help all veterans become more active, improve their overall quality of life, and thrive. For the most accurate health information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Hello, 60 Second Science fans. This is Jeff Del Vizio. I'm the executive producer of the podcast. First, I really just want to thank you for all being loyal listeners for however long you've been listening. And just in case that's from the very start, you've been with us now for 16 years, three months, and seven days, counting today. That's near prehistoric in podcast years. In that time, we've published well over 3,000 episodes on every imaginable science and health topic. But on September 5th, 2006, we started it all off with Beatles. Karen Hopkin, who's been with us the whole way, honestly, she really has. She just did a segment last week on how your female pooch is definitely judging you. Described how MIT researchers were making water-saving materials based off the nature tech built into the Namib Desert Beetle. Here, for nostalgia's sake, is that segment in full. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Karen Hopkin. This will just take a minute. Biologist J.B.S. Haldane once said that the creator, if he exists, has an inordinate fondness of beetles. Well, so do researchers at MIT. Inspired by the Namib desert beetle, MIT engineers Robert Cohn and Michael Rubner have produced a new material that can trap and control tiny volumes of water. The Namib desert in southern Africa is one of the driest spots on Earth. Its inhabitants survive by extracting precious moisture from the light morning fog that periodically sweeps across the desert sands. The beetle's wings are studded with hydrophilic bumps that collect water droplets and hydrophobic channels that funnel the droplets into the bug's mouth. The MIT scientists used a similar design for their beetle-mimicking material, described in an online version of the journal Nano Letters. Such materials could be used to help move small liquid samples around a lab on a chip, or to make tents that could provide shelter and a cool drink to people who camp in the desert. The water-harvesting material might not represent intelligent design, but it's sure a good example of intelligent imitation. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Karen Hopkin. Fascinating and actually 60 seconds long, which really is why I'm here talking to you all today. The podcast that you've loved and listened to for so long is getting a major update. 
We're going to start with changing the name to reflect reality. We're really into reality around here. The show hasn't been just a minute for a long time, so we're going to stop saying that it is. But the show itself isn't going anywhere. Exactly the opposite. In the new year, we'll be back with a fresh new name and look. We'll be publishing more often, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday to start. And we'll take you on sonic journeys that still respect your time, so they'll be quick, but we'll also expand the breadth of what we cover. It's going to be really fascinating and fun, and we want you all there for the ride. While we prep for the big relaunch, we're going to take an extended holiday break. Plus, a little bit. But don't worry, we'll be back in your podcast feed in early 2023 with new, exciting shows that dive into fascinating science and still leave you in wonder, but with plenty of time left in your day for everything else. We'll see you all then, and thanks. For the show now formerly known as 60 Second Science, I'm Jeff Delisio. This is an important message from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. When it snows this winter, make sure you clear more than your driveway. Before you hit the road and before you get in the driver's seat, check to be sure that your vehicle's tailpipe is clear of snow. If the tailpipe is blocked, carbon monoxide, an odorless, colorless, and deadly gas produced by your engine, can build up quickly inside your vehicle, poisoning anyone inside. To learn more, call 1-800-CDC-INFO. That's 1-800-232-4636. Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to NetRootsRadio.com, show your progressive side and go to the Donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power NetRoots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our Donate button at the bottom of NetRootsRadio.com. Thank you for keeping progressive radio at full power. James Whitey Bulger, an organized crime kingpin in Boston for decades, extorted, tortured, and murdered people. I'm criminal defense attorney Luke Ryan, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute with ACLU attorney Bill Newman. After an FBI agent gave Bulger a heads up about his imminent indictment in 1994, Bulger skipped town and lived on the lam until his arrest in 2011, after which he was tried, convicted, and sentenced to two life terms plus five years. Bulger's FBI handler helped him because Bulger also was an FBI informant. And in prison, informants can be in deep trouble. Indeed, when Bulger was transferred to the Hazleton, West Virginia Penitentiary in 2018, where known enemies of his were doing time, inmates placed bets on how long he would survive, which wasn't long. Within hours of his arrival, he was bludgeoned to death. The recent Inspector General's report says that Bulger, who is a frail 89-year-old in a wheelchair, should never have been transferred to that prison and never placed in general population there. Never, not even close. Prison authorities knew that Bulger, and obviously in many ways atypical inmate, would receive enormous publicity if something happened to him. Which raises the bigger question. How much attention do we pay to the safety and health of the not famous more than 2 million people locked up in American prisons and jails today. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because, as the criminal legal system proves every day, freedom can't protect itself. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 2006. That was the day that a morning explosion at the Sago Mine in West Virginia claimed the lives of 12 miners. The Federal Mine Safety and Health Administration had cited the mine more than 200 times the year before the disaster. 29 miners were in the section of the mine where the explosion occurred. One miner died instantly from the blast. 12 more were trapped with the lethal gases that had built up in the mine. Rescue efforts began to try and reach the miners. Then, an incorrect report came that the trapped miners were alive, two miles inside the mine. On the surface, church bells rang and rescue crews scrambled to set up medical stations. News outlets reported on the miracle in West Virginia. But the reports were not accurate. 
only one of the trapped miners was found alive. Randall McCloy was rescued at 1.30 in the morning on January 4th. Despite the record of safety violations, the mining company, the International Coal Group, tried to claim that the explosion was caused by a lightning strike. The United Mine Workers of America Union rejected that excuse. The union issued a report on their findings after the disaster. Their report was critical of both the mine operators and the federal safety oversight of the mine. It included the statement, the fact is that the tragedy that morning was preventable and should never have occurred. The company reopened the mine just a few months later, although the cause of the explosion remained undetermined. Due to pressure, it later decided to close the mine. Like what you hear? Check out more at laborhistoryin2.com. Most folks thought that up was down. We all lived and gave our soul. Did it all smoking cold. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy River City Hash Mondays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 33 degrees Fahrenheit. Expecting highs much cooler even than what we had over the weekend, and it wasn't very warm over the weekend. Looks like we're only going to get up to be about 41 or 42 today. Uh, We are under foggy conditions at the moment. Rain showers will be arriving, oh, in about an hour or so, and then that will evolve into a steady rain all afternoon and into the night winds light and variable looks like we're going to get a dropping of about a quarter of an inch considerable cloudiness overnight lows in the low 30s winds light and variable and then a small chance of rain tomorrow but and we will be cloudy with highs around 42 to 41 winds light and variable wednesday it looks like we have the atmospheric river coming through so we'll see how that goes looks like it'll be through the rest of the week pollen is rated as none here in rogue river proper the air quality index for the region is in the good range at 28 parts per million and the daytime uv index is low at level one barometric pressure is falling at 29.81 inches visibility is a little less than one mile and Relative humidity is at 94%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 45 degrees and clear. Paris is 51 and partly cloudy. Rome is 60 degrees and mostly cloudy. Kiev is 43 and mostly cloudy. Kabul is 25 and clear. Hong Kong is 64 and fair. Tokyo is 39 degrees and partly cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 70 degrees and partly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 48 degrees, mostly cloudy, under a flood watch. And New York, New York is 52 degrees Fahrenheit and fair. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. John Gambrell of the Associated Press brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. 
Dubai ended its 30% tax on alcohol sales in the shake dumb yesterday, Sunday, and made its required liquor licenses free to obtain, ending a long-standing source of revenue for its ruling family to apparently further boost tourism to the Emirate. The sudden New Year's Day announcement made by the Dubai's two state-linked alcohol retailers came apparently from a government decree from its ruling Al Maktoum family. However, government officials did not immediately acknowledge the decision and did not respond to questions from the Associated Press. But it follows years of loosening regulations over liquor in the shakedom, which now sells alcohol during daylight hours in Ramadan and began providing home delivery during the lockdowns at the start of the coronavirus pandemic. Alcohol sales have long served as a major barometer of the du- of the economy of Dubai, a top travel destination in the UAE, home to the long-haul carrier Emirates. During the recent World Cup in nearby Qatar, Dubai's many bars drew commuting soccer fans. However, a pint of beer easily can cost over $10 at a bar, with other drinks running even higher. Well, it sounds like here. It wasn't immediately clear if this would cause a price drop at alcohol-serving establishments or if it would only affect those buying it from retailers. Alcohol distributor Maritime and Mercantile International, which is part of the wider Emirates Group, made the announcement in a statement. Since we began our operations in Dubai over 100 years ago, the Emirates' approach has remained dynamic, sensitive, and inclusive for all, said Tyrone Reed of MMI. These recently updated regulations are instrumental to continuing to ensure the safe and responsible purchase and consumption of alcohol beverages in Dubai and the UAE. MMI did not respond to a question over whether the decision was permanent. However, an ad put up by MMI urged customers to buy from its stores, saying, you no longer need to drive out to the other Emirates. Dubai residents have long driven into Um Al Quwain and other Emirates for bulk tax-free alcohol purchases. African and Eastern, the second alcohol retailer, believed to be at least partially held by the state or affiliated firms, also announced the end of the municipality tax and the license fees. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Rester toujours fidèle C'est tout C'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps Mes étés de mer Mes autumns, quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Sabina Nixick of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, River City Hash Mondays. At the stroke of midnight on Saturday, Croatia switched to the shared European currency, the euro, and removed dozens of border checkpoints to join the world's largest passport-free travel area. It marked a fresh start for the small Balkan nation of four million people that captured international attention three decades ago as the site of a brutal war that left nearly a quarter of its economy in ruins. Joining Europe's ID check-free Sengen zone means Croats will now be among almost 420 million people who are free to roam its 27 member countries without passports for work or leisure. Adopting the euro will likewise offer Croatia the benefits stemming from deeper financial ties with the currency's 19 other users and with the European Central Bank. 
It will also make traveling and doing business easier, removing the hassle of currency exchange for Croats going abroad and for tens of thousands of tourists who visit their country each year for work or to enjoy its stunning Adriatic coastline. As revelers around Croatia took to the streets to ring in the new year, the country's interior minister, Dvor Bozonovic, was at the Bregana border with Slovenia to wish the best of luck to the last travelers to have their passports checked there. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day, but you do know, Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up here tomorrow for... Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here tomorrow, right here, in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TR, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver